Welcome back for the final part of the product line analysis lecture. Now, we've seen some possibilities to analyze feature mappings for product lines. Um, and we have asked different questions about that. For example, whether there are contradictory, unnecessary preprocessor annotations, whether the code which we are interested in is even included in any product. And maybe we could also use a sharp set server to ask in how many products the code is included and whether this is a critical number of products. So these were all code agnostic anomalies. So anomalies that weren't really uh, caring about which kind of programming language we used. Now we're trying to analyze the variable code. So code which is occurring in some products, but not in all products. And we can ask different questions here. For example, we could uh, just ask the question whether every product of the product line can actually be generated. Generated can mean, for example, compiling programs to uh, find, for example, all syntax errors or type errors. But we could also imagine to, uh, to, to execute all tests, unit tests, for example, integration tests for the products and uh, try to find uh, at least some runtime and logic errors of our products. And uh, of course, we could also try to actually prove that there are no mistakes to rule out some, some errors. And uh, we might do this by providing specifications for our code and using model checkers and uh, formal verifiers to actually write automatically uh, write proofs for these, um, uh, yeah, these functional or non-functional properties also. And what we're going to do now is we are trying uh, one example, namely, namely type checking for feature-oriented programming and conditional compilation, or at least we are giving some, some hints at how such a type checker can be implemented and how uh, the basic idea always here is to reduce the type checking problem to a satisfiability problem, which is often done in a family-based analysis. To get started, we are trying to analyze feature modules again. So we are in the space of feature-oriented programming and we have a very good modularization, which is a little bit easier to explain. We already know the example. We have a, a store with a single store, multi-store and access control. And you also already have seen uh, the, this implementation in the second part of the lecture. And uh, now the question is, are there any type errors in this? Um, in this product line and specifically is there any product which includes a type error so we have four products and probably some of these products will compile and will not have any type errors but maybe there are some hidden errors which we only see if we derive specific products and i give you a hint uh, let's just look at the product ssac which is the product uh, selecting a single store and access control so we have uh, this module and we also have this module. And um, if you take a closer look, you can also just pause the video for a second. Um, but um, if you don't want to, um, I can just uh, spoil the, the problem, which is uh, that we have this read all method here in the access control module. And this method tries to call the refined read all method with the super keyword. And if you remember, the super keyword is um, trying to call the, uh, the method next up the refinement chain, similar to the usual super in uh, inheritance hierarchies. Now, the other feature model, the next uh, feature module above in the refinement chain is the single store. But in the single store, there is no read all. Because this read all is missing, this uh, product will cause a type error when we try to derive it, when we try to compile it, because uh, this uh, super call cannot be resolved correctly. And uh, we can try to fix this, um, or at least detect this, with reachability conditions. This is somewhat similar to the presence conditions we saw in the last part of the lecture. However, now we are trying to re reason about references and definitions. What we see below here is a reference. This function call references a read all method. And we also have definitions. For example, here is a definition of read all. And the basic idea is that each definition in our, uh, excuse me, each reference in our source code has to refer to some definition in our source code. And we can express this logically we can just take for um, the presence condition of, an, of a reference, say that uh, having a reference 
for for this identifier so it is some identifier like read all having a reference for read all means that we have to have at least one definition of the same identifier so read all so here we might say that the presence condition of read all has to imply at least one definition of read all and now we can uh, have a look at where are uh, any definitions of read all and there is actually only one there is only one uh, the one in multistore so there is only um, okay uh, this is the reference and this is the definition of read all and there is only one you can see it here we are trying to call the reference uh, in this case is access control and we are trying uh, we are trying to call uh, read all and it's only defined in multistore now the problem is of course <laughs> we are trying in this product uh, to derive uh, the access control together with the single store and that's not possible so um, having these reachability conditions helps us to um, to define or, or to find out which identifiers can actually uh, be reached always and uh, we can also use a set solver of course for this yes we can um, take the feature model which is also always included here uh, refer to the second part for including or excluding the feature model which is both possible but it makes more sense to include it um, to exclude invalid configurations so we take the feature model and then we basically try to uh, include the reference in this case it would be the uh, access control here and uh, then we want uh, when we try to uh, uh, we, we um, uh, to deselect all the definitions in this case only the multi-store definition and if that's not possible then um, the identifier is reachable or yeah uh, put differently the um, the product which we're looking at the single store and the access control control it just has no uh, no definition of read all so uh, in this case the formula does not hold and uh, we get the problem now in a type safe product line all references must always be defined in other words all of these reachability conditions for all identifiers must be tautological must hold However, of course, there are many, many more conditions that must hold. We have now only looked at this reachability thing. So we, we can look at, we have looked at um, superset, for example. Is this always defined? Yes, here it's defined. And here it's also defined. Uh, super read here is also always defined, namely here and here. And the read all we have already seen is not always defined. And that's the problem here. But of course, we haven't looked at the actual types right so for example uh, all of these uh, methods return objects and this uh, method becomes uh, gets an object and we would have to uh, check whether these uh, types are actually correct okay for object it's not that interesting because every object uh, is an object in java but um, maybe the number of parameters and so on we would have to check this however um, this is already giving an, uh, an impression how this works for feature modules Okay, um, we have seen now how this works for feature-oriented programming. However, it gets a little bit more involved when we uh, look again at conditional compilation with the C preprocessor. But let's do that, do that for a minute. Again, we have the graph example. The graph can be directed, undirected, or uh, can be a hypergraph, or he, it can have edges that are uh, hyper edges. And we had this implementation. It's the same, almost the same implementation as in the um, second part. However, I uh, added here a small operator, which is uh, C++'s version of a um, printing operator. It just takes an edge and uh, uses this operator to output the edge on the standard out stream or any other stream. And it uses the nodes. Of an edge of course if i want to print an edge to the command line i need its nodes to to lock them and this notes here is a reference yes and uh, a reference always has to be defined so we can have a look at some reachability conditions and ask whether this eap.notes is actually reachable and the reachability condition looks the same as before so for each reference to e.notes 
we have to have at least one definition of e dot nodes. Okay, and we can have a look. Where is e dot nodes defined? Okay, this is the edge class. Nodes is defined here, here, and here. So uh, there are three definitions. Okay, then we can have a look at the presence condition of the reference. The presence condition of the reference is true because the uh, this line of code is always included. It is not uh, nested in any if def directive. And um, therefore, the left side of the implication is true. And we also take the feature model into account. And the right side now is just a disjunction, an or of the three definitions. The three definitions, reminder, are these ones. And they have the presence conditions directed. And uh, then we have uh, another if def, which has the um, uh, undirected and hyper as a presence condition here. And this line has hyper and directed. And at least one of these must be true. So uh, for e dot nodes to be reachable, to uh, reach at least one of these. And this holds because each graph, if you have a look at the feature model here, um, each graph is directed or an undirected hypergraph. You can work out the logic, but this works. Now, this is very similar to what we've seen uh, on the slide before with, for uh, feature-oriented programming. A slight complication now uh, happens when multiple definitions are included at once. If you have a look, it could maybe happen that uh, these three lines here are uh, occurring at the same time and then uh, because uh, um, the preprocessor does not uh, prevent us from doing this. So we also have to ask ourselves, does this reference conflict in the sense that two or more definitions are available? And for this, we need to introduce another uh, condition, a conflict condition, um, and which guarantees that no definition of E dot nodes in this case conflicts with another definition of the same. What do we do? Okay, we just take all pairs of definitions, so uh, these two, uh, then the uh, uh, the second and the third, and the first and the third. We uh, take all these pairs and check that mm, it is never the case that two are selected. So we just uh, do a pairwise exclusion of these presence conditions, and in our example, we can just do that. Um, this is uh, if you just take these three presence conditions up here and t uh, take pairwise um, uh, examples, you have the first and the second, the first and the third, and the second and third. And uh, this yields a somewhat uh, a complicated formula, but you can work it out that it also holds, it's, it's also a tautology, because a graph is never directed and uh, an undirected hypergraph at the same time. So uh, basically, these three definitions are exclusive. All in all, we can say that um, the, the e dot nodes reference here uh, is reaches always some definition, either this one or this one, or maybe this one, and never several ones, only uh, exactly one. Yes, and this is exactly what we need for uh, an unambiguous and uh, compilable program. So in this example, everything worked out. Of course, this was just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Um, we only discussed these two kinds of conditions here, reachability and conflict conditions. Uh, I already said this, uh, actual type checking would require that we make a big table of all identifiers, of all types, the presence conditions, and checking uh, a lot more ZAT queries. Of course, this is just uh, an impression. In practice, uh, the difficulty of this uh, technique depends on yeah, what, several things. So you uh, could use feature-oriented programming instead of the C preprocessor, which we've already seen. Um, we did not have to consider conflict conditions for feature-oriented programming because of the superimposition. Yeah, We have these feature modules which layer each other and the layers on top override the ones on the bottom or the other way around, depending how you want to see it. And um, it is simply not possible to define the same identifier twice because they are just uh, refined. Also, FOP has some uh, advantage because it has a good feature traceability. We have uh, perfect modularization, basically. So the presence conditions get much more easier and uh, we have to solve simpler and less such calls, possibly. 
And what you also can do, I always included the feature model at the beginning, so I always had this uh, formula of, of the feature model, which implied uh, the rest of the conditions. Um, this is usually a good idea because you can uh, exclude uh, the invalid configurations, but it also um, maybe has an impact on performance, so you can remove it to get better performance. On the other hand, you obviously then get false positives, possibly. Now, um, this was just uh, so the, uh, the theory behind a very practical tool, which has been developed um, 12 years ago, the TypeChef project, um, where researchers actually tried to check this out, uh, to, to, to try this out on actual software projects. TypeChef is a variability aware Lexa parser framework at type system. So the keyword here is the variability aware, which is new. Yeah, um, there are many Lexa parser frameworks, type systems, compilers, and so on. But uh, for uh, investigating C code with C preprocessor statements, uh, there are not so many tools that are actually aware of the variability. And TypeChef does this. It skips the preprocessing step. So it keeps if diffs in the code, which is different from the GCC, for example, or LLVM compilers, which uh, do the preprocessing first and um, then only analyze one product. Instead, we uh, in TypeChef, we skip the preprocessing and build an abstract syntax tree, which is annotated with presence conditions. And uh, I can just show this for a minute. Here we have a poster which explains the TypeChef approach. And one goal uh, which the authors had was uh, to pass and type check all configurations of the Linux kernel, uh, which are a lot. It's, uh, so up to two to the ten thousand, probably much more less because uh, much less because um, the feature model uh, usually uh, forbids a lot of a lot of combinations. And uh, the basic idea of TypeShift is that we take this kind of piece of code, uh, annotated with uh, pre uh, C preprocessor directives. We have two plus three times x, and the x depends on whether uh, it is defined or uh, whether a is defined or not defined. And a type chef then takes this with its variability of Alexa and uh, lexes it into a token stream. So we have uh, like a opening parentheses would be one token. And interestingly, what is new is that this uh, token x here is now replaced by four or by y depending on the a. So the a is annotated here a bit small as a or not a. So the information about features and present conditions is kept in this uh, lexing and in this token screen stream. And this token stream is then, as it's always done in compiler construction, uh, parsed with a parser, which is in this case also variability aware. So we get a pass uh, an abstract syntax tree, a multiplication of two plus three, and uh, the four or the y now depends on this choice node here, which says, okay, when A is uh, selected, then take a four. When it's not selected, take a Y. And this AST can then be analyzed, and this also uses a lot of the satisfiability techniques, which I showed you earlier. But this is the basic idea. So it's not so different from a typical compiler, but it is a variability aware. Now, um, you can do this. The question is, does it really work? Does it scale? And uh, the authors of this paper tried to run this on the BusyBox uh, tool suite, which is basically a, a collection of Unix tools. And you can uh, select and deselect these tools to get a, a customized binary of BusyBox, which is then very small. And you can put it on your embedded device, Internet of Things device, whatever. Um, BusyBox has 811 features, and they needed 57 minutes to type check it completely. So every configuration of BusyBox could be um, proven to not contain any type error, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, if you have a look here, uh, BusyBox has obviously two to the 811 configurations uh, as, a, as an upper bound. So this is a very, very large number, which I'm not going to pronounce. It has 245 digits. And just imagine for a second, that you would analyze all of these products independently. You would uh, just normally you would compile each of these products with a uh, GCC or your compiler of choice, and it would tell you yes it works and give you some kind of binary. But uh, compiling all of these products independently it's just uh, not feasible. So here the family-based analysis um, obviously 
helps a lot and, and makes it happen in, a, in one hour, in under one hour. So it's uh, uh, already nice. For Linux, they also tried this for the Linux kernel and uh, it was not as successful. So Linux has just uh, 10 times the features of BusyBox. So it's very large uh, or this version analyzed of Linux was already very large. So um, they could not type check it in the end. They parsed it in roughly 85 hours. So they needed three days to just get this abstract syntax tree, which I showed you before, um, which is uh, pretty wide that uh, the type checking did not even work out at all and parsing already took so long. Um, we can see here that uh, type checking Linux with this family-based approach is still very, very hard. So in essence, we can say that uh, this family-based analysis with the TypeShift project really uh, makes a big, big impact on performance. So it makes it feasible to, ana uh, to analyze a really big systems such as BusyBox, but it still uh, is challenging to uh, analyze uh, the hugest systems available, like the Linux kernel. Yeah, um, relating to, to uh, complexity, we can um, in general have a look at how complex is a product line even. So we've seen several examples in this uh, lecture on the lecture slides. Usually we have very small feature models, which you can often imagine that uh, product-based analysis is even efficient still. And now the, we ended with the Linux kernel, which was really, really hard to analyze. And uh, yeah, we tried uh, to... Um, um, to make some uh, proposition of yeah, tr finding out how difficult a product line is to analyze um, by giving several classes of product line complexity. And now I want you to imagine that we have a time frame of 24 hours. So we have one day and we want to try to uh, analyze a product line automatically and we want to see how large or how small can this product line be to be in a given complexity class. Now, some product lines we have to exclude here uh, because not all products uh, can be uh, generated automatically for some product lines. For example, if you do any implementation technique in this lecture that has custom development in the application engineering part of the product line process, we cannot automatically generate anything. You have to remember the glue code for components or orchestration for services or uh, maybe a white box frameworks. So um, we don't consider these. Now we only consider product lines which can be completely automated like the Linux kernel, like BusyBox um, and other automated techniques. Now there is a class of software product lines that can be, uh, whose products can be generated and tested completely in a time frame of 24 hours. And we try to calculate, uh, let us assume that each product takes about one minute to compile, to generate, to test. Then uh, if your product line is, has less than 2000 products, it is in this class. So for a product line with less than 2000 products, it can be, uh, all products can be uh, tested in a reasonable time frame. So a product-based analysis is okay, basically okay for, for this kind of product line. Um, I mean, you can work it out if you have two to the uh, 11 features, you already have 2048 products and your product line would already not be included in C1, but instead it would be included in C2. So uh, the classes get more difficult as you get down here. So C2, these are all product lines that are not testable in one day, but compilable at least. Okay, so let us assume that each product takes just one second to compile, then in a time frame of 24 hours, we would uh, be able to compile 90,000 products. So if your product line has less than 90,000 products, it still is basically generatable in a reasonable time frame, so compilable. So uh, type checking, for example, is of course a part of compilation would then be possible. Next, we have the product lines which cannot be tested feasibly and cannot also be compiled feasibly, but at least we can still generate all configurations. So we are not talking about generating the products themselves, only the descriptions of the products. And we can just assume that for each uh, configuration, we just uh, have one nanosecond, which is uh, not a lot, and uh, it's a millionth part of a second. And in that case, if our product line has less than 10 to the 13 configurations, 
it is still feasibly, uh, uh, it is in this class and it is still feasible to generate at least all configurations. So uh, 10 to the 13, it is basically a one with 13 zeros. So if I didn't miscount, it's this number. It looks like a lot, but uh, you can already have this for uh, not a lot of features, maybe two or three dozen features. If you want to do this, you can, for example, use an OSAT solver, which we discussed in the fourth lecture. Now, some product lines are even harder and it's difficult to generate all configurations, but sometimes we can at least count the number of valid configurations. If you remember this from the fourth lecture, we have already seen tools that can do this. These are the sharp set solvers. And for this, we have also some examples. So uh, most product lines uh, can be counted feasibly, um, but uh, those can also typically be generated or the configurations can be generated. So we have some, some examples, for example, the uh, Automotive 5 model, which is a, um, a feature model from an industrial partner in the automotive domain, so a car manufacturer basically, and they have a model that uh, is large enough that we cannot generate all the configurations, but at least we can count them. And we have already talked about the counting, model counting analyses at the fourth part of the lecture, that they uh, can also be very useful, even if we cannot even in, uh, actually enumerate the, uh, the products. And also some older versions of the Linux kernel fall in this category. So um, we can count the number of valid configurations, but uh, not basically so much more than that, uh, at least uh, regarding uh, generation of configurations, enumeration. Now you can imagine that this goes on. So um, we can, uh, there are some product lines which we cannot even count the number of valid configurations. We can just find out whether there is a configuration. And you already know the tool for this. It's a satisfiability solver. And um, yeah, uh, newer versions of these product lines, uh, which I had uh, talked about before, so the automotive product line, and also newer versions of Linux fall in this category. So basically, if you take the latest version of the Linux kernel and take the feature model of uh, this this kernel, you don't, you are not uh, able to derive the number of valid configurations. We don't even know how many configurations there are. We know it's not more than two to the 10,000, but uh, the actual number is still a mystery. And it's an open research question. Now, if you pay attention, there's a sixth class, namely, we cannot do anything. <laughs> we cannot test the products, we cannot generate them, we cannot generate configurations, we cannot count the configurations, we cannot even know whether there is a valid configuration. Theoretically, there is this last class of hardest product lines where we cannot do anything of this. And uh, maybe a reconciliatory uh, conclusion of this lecture is that at least there is no example known for this class. So we do not know of any product line which we cannot analyze at all. There are some examples which are very hard to analyze, granted, for example, the current Linux kernel. And there are, of course, also many simple examples on our slides, which are very easy to uh, analyze, but we don't know of anything in this class. So that's at least some kind of uh, reconciliation. Okay. Now to round this off, um, you've seen in this whole lecture series, uh, some product line analyses, and I'm going to summarize them a bit. Um, in the fourth lecture, in the final part of the fourth lecture, we talked a lot about feature model analyses, which only analyze the feature model. So this was basically only happening in the problem space of the product line. And with this, we could, for example, find out current date features, whether a feature model is actually uh, uh, satisfiable or not, and implement configurators. And then we also have the solution space here. Um, and this is what we uh, learned today in the lecture 10, um, where we analyze uh, feature mappings, which can or cannot consider the feature model. So we uh, extended our notion of dead features to dead code and could also uh, analyze superfluous annotations, degree of code scattering, and so on. And uh, also right now we uh, talked about the actual code, moving even further into the solution space, considered the feature model 
and the feature mapping. So uh, this can be used to do some uh, parsing of code, type checking, which is what, what I taught, uh, taught you about right now, but also, for example, model checking and theorem proving are things that you can also do. We've seen this only for the examples of conditional compilation and feature-oriented programming. Of course, you can uh, think of how this works with other implementation techniques and uh, summarizing this all with uh, these analyses, we can analyze functional properties of several products at once. We can also uh, summarize or analyze non-functional properties. Um, type checking products, uh, all products of a product line at once is actually possible if the product line is not too large. For very large product lines, actually the hugest examples known Linux, uh, it's still infeasible and this is an open question. We have a lot of reading on this and maybe you can think about this too. Um, suppose you have a product line which has if devs and uh, you might think about, okay, we can just turn these if devs into ifs. And then we move from a preprocessor based product line into a runtime variability based product line from lecture two. Now, then you can use just any compiler to find any type error in any product. And this would be a legitimate family based analysis. Basically, you have lifted the analysis from single products onto uh, all products at once. Question is, is what I described uh, just now possible? To which degree is it possible? What problems might occur when you try to do this? And with that, thank you for listening to this lecture. Um, and we will hope to see you again in the next lecture on product line testing.